Good Thursday, everyone. Um, we are having this webinar, Accelerating Health, um, Empowering People and Community and Cancer Care to really coincide with World Cancer Day that is on Saturday. Um, we wanna bring your attention to um, opportunities to um, prevent um, and treat cancer. And we have a wonderful panel joining us today. I'm excited about this. I'm excited about sharing some information and um, before we get started, I thought it would be helpful to give a little bit. First of all, I should introduce myself. I'm Joya Delgado Harris. I'm executive director of CEO Cancer Gold Standard. I've been with the organization for about a year and a half and um, really excited about my role in working with gold standard companies and with going for gold universities and colleges. It's been a wonderful year and a half and I look forward to what's to come. Um, CEO Roundtable on Cancer, one of the reasons I came here was because of our mission. They were started in um, early 2000s by the late George H.W. Bush, President Bush. Um, he and his wife, Barbara, lost a child uh, at the age of three, Robin, to cancer. And so he had a lifelong commitment to um, look at eradicating cancer and how can he reduce the burden of cancer. So about a, a little over a decade after coming out of office, he started CEO Roundtable on Cancer, with the help and leadership of a friend um, and so our founding chairman and very close um, um, advisor, Mr. Bob Ingram, who was then the CEO of Glaxo Welcome. So together they convened a literal and figurative round table bringing together CEOs from companies from pharma, from different industries, um, from corporate, nonprofit, government, um, academic to help figure out how we can solve um, or reduce the burden of cancer and eradicate cancer. Um, one of the premier initiatives or programs that came out of that gathering is the Cancer Gold Standard. It is, I call it almost a good housekeeping seal of approval. It is a, um, a mark, an indication that a company is committed to the culture of health in the organization. It is a way of looking at um, health and benefits packages and helping to ensure they're comprehensive and um, inclusive of covering different aspects of oncology care um, from health education navigation to prevention and early detection to accelerating treatment should one or their loved ones become diagnosed with cancer to um, survivorship and well being. And looking at well being just beyond healthy um, physical health, but environmental, um, emotional financial well-being. So with those five pillars, companies can look at different aspects of, of what that would entail to help ensure that they're giving their employees, their corporate family, the best um, opportunities to be in control of their health care, of their health rather, in health care. So one of the um, reasons why we're coming together is to help um, share some information towards that end and to help give you an opportunity to figure out how to apply that, how organizations, whether you are a school, a university partner, or a corporate partner, how you can apply some of these um, pillars and, and learnings, these best practices. Um, we also have at CEO Rounty Long Cancer, our Project Data Sphere um, program. It's an online laboratory library, if you will, that allows people to come together and share information and um, analyze data from the scientific um, side of the house. And um, Going for Gold is our newest partnership. And I use that term partnership um, intently. It is a partnership um, bringing together, you taking that, that gold standard framework, that workplace wellness accreditation and applying it to university campuses so that the schools are looking at their health and benefits packages, um, looking at their faculty and staff and evaluating that. But beyond that, looking at how we can help um, develop or amplify programs that help students, alumni, and, um, and the communities around the campus to help with their health care. So we are thrilled to have, we launched that program last year, Going for Gold. We had eight schools at launch this time last year. Now we have 16 and we're growing. And so our panel today, ironically, has come to us through that, through those all the affiliations of CEO Roundtable on Cancer, and I'm excited to introduce them in a moment. Um, I am excited to introduce them, but I also want to take a pause because I'll, we don't need any more reminders, but um, we have a reminder that one of our CEO Roundtable 
on cancer family members, if you will, was recently diagnosed with colon cancer. Um, she gave me permission to share her story. She wanted to, um, she was just diagnosed about three weeks ago. Um, Dr. Lynette Wood is Dean of the Business School at Shaw University, which is one of our Going for Gold Partner Schools. And she shared with me that her affiliation with this organization and the Going for Gold Partnership is what prompted her to get a colonoscopy. And, um, you know, one of the things in public health is there, there's a, such a difference between knowing and doing, and we can hear something a lot, we can see something, but some, there's sometimes when somebody has a personal experience, it prompts us to get, um, a, 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 take some action. And so, um, you know, our, our thoughts and prayers and positive energy is very much with Dean Wood as she starts treatment. And, um, and she's got such a spirit that, um, that we're with her very much. And I, I know that I trust that um, her experience will, will help other people to take their health care under control like she did and, um, and prompt a screening where there's a screening. And that is what we'll talk about today. So I don't like to have that reminder, but we have it. It's a real life, real time example of the necessity of taking your health into your own hands and to making sure that you are doing the best you can to give you, um, you know, your best chance of, of, of just being. So um, that's who we are, see around table on cancer. And our panelists today, I'm gonna to introduce uh, Dr. Fred Littles. He comes to us, he is a proud graduate of South Carolina State University, one of our Going for Gold members. He also went to Howard Medical School and is a radiation oncologist at Mon Health. Cancer Center in Morgantown, West Virginia. Um, I love that Dr. Littles, he reached out to us and said, I've heard about this program, how can I help? And so uh, Mary Liz Rich, our president and I spoke with him and, and he, we talked for a long time, had a wonderful conversation and hence we're led to today. So we appreciate his expertise on this call. We'll also hear in a little bit after Dr. Littles speaks from Dr. Donald Alsendor from Meharry Medical College where he is associate professor and, and also at Vanderbilt, I believe he's associate professor, and he has a wealth of experience and um, expertise that will help lead us through our vaccine preventable cancer segment. And then Carrie Hatfield from Jasper Health, chief growth officer will kind of close us out and help give us some information about Jasper Health and the programs they offer, and also just about workplace initiatives anyway to help our employees and um, again, take their health under, their, under control. So I will stop talking and I will pass the mic, if you will, to Dr. Littles, who will talk to us more about those cancers where we have screenings for and, and help us get some more information about that. So Dr. Littles, thank you. Mrs. Harris, thank you so much. Um, it is certainly my pleasure to, uh, to be here today. Hello to everyone. And I hope uh, you all find my brief presentation helpful. And uh, I assure you, I thank, uh, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for everything. I want to talk about cancer screening specifically, lung cancer, colorectal cancer, breast cancer, and prostate cancer. Knowledge is power. And cancer screening, uh, without question, saves lives. There are a lot of that a lot of you know medicine is continuing to change and continue to evolve. You know, every year is better is better than the year before decades um and there are a lot of questions about certain things in medicine as we do research there is no question about cancer screening this is literally no question about cancer screening cancer screening saves lives if you ever want to remember anything i talk about today remember that cancer screening saves lives i want to start uh with the deadliest cancer. I'm a numbers person, so I, I look at everything analytically, almost everything analytically. Uh, lung cancer is the deadliest cancer. 25% of all cancer deaths are lung cancer, uh, more than breast cancer, prostate cancer, and colorectal cancer combined. In uh, 2020, there were approximately 136,000 people that died from lung cancer. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force uh, recommends annual low-dose CT scans in adults ages 50 through 80 
who have a 20 pack year history of cigarette smoking. A 20 pack year history of cigarette smoking. That means one pack a day for 20 years, 1.5 packs a day for 15 years, two packs a day for 10 years, or half a pack a day for 40 years. A 20 pack year history of cigarette smoking, annual low dose CT scans for screening saves lives. No doubt about it. I also want to take a minute to talk to you about something that uh, few people really know about. Few people really know about this. This is called third-hand smoke exposure. Not first-hand where you're smoking, not second-hand where you smell like smoker, smoking around you. It's third-hand smoke exposure. This is when you get in a car and you smell cigarettes in the car and you're the only person in the car and you're not smoking or someone else is in the car. Or you smell it on someone else's clothes or you smell it on their furniture or you smell it on their breath. If you're smelling it, you are getting it and third hand smoke exposure, that's what third hand is. They're not smoking around you and you're not smoking yourself, but you're smelling it. And if you're smelling it, you're getting it and it is dangerous. If you're smelling it, you're getting it, and it is dangerous. This is even more of a reason to quit smoking. Now, when I talked about low-dose screening for lung cancer, unfortunately for the deadliest cancer known to man, only 6% of eligible patients, eligible adults, that are eligible to get screened are getting screened, and that's simply because of the lack of awareness, the lack of awareness of our lay community and the lack of awareness of our medical community. So that's why it's important to talk about this first and foremost. So out of the four, the deadliest cancer has the lowest screening rate. It's just the opposite of what it should be. So 6%, we have a long way to go. We have a long way to go. The second leading cause of cancer death in the United States and worldwide is colorectal cancer. 52,000 deaths in the United States last year. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force recommends that you start screening at age 45. It used to be 50, and I think three to four years ago, it changed to 45. As a cancer specialist, I have to say that I'm biased toward colonoscopy every 10 years. And since uh, Mrs. Harris mentioned the gold standard, it's, it's my professional opinion that the gold standard for colorectal screening is colonoscopy. It allows for immediate biopsies of polyps and cancers and is great at detecting small, benign, or precancerous lesions. So you can diagnose it and you can remove it all in the same, same procedure. Colorectal cancer, colonoscopy is the gold standard. A test that has been marketed very aggressively, I think over the past five to 10 years, is Cologuard. And that's a DNA um, stool sample. And it also looks at uh, what we call occult or hidden blood. And that should be done uh, every three years. So 6% of eligible adults getting lung cancer screening and 60% of eligible adults are getting screened for colorectal cancer. Six versus 60. Colonoscopies lead to a 50% reduction in mortality from colorectal cancer by getting a colonoscopy, 50% reduction. And just to go back to lung cancer, CT scans lead to a 25% reduction in mortality, 20 to 25%. So the United States study, New England Journal of Medicine showed a 20%. The Netherlands study showed a 24 to 25%. But if you're having a reduction of a very deadly cancer of 20 to 25%, those are phenomenal numbers for the general public. Breast cancer. American Cancer Society recommends it, that uh, women of average risk should be screened beginning at age 40 to 44. Age 40 to 44. And women who are 55 years and older can switch to every other year or choose to continue of uh, getting a mammogram on a yearly basis. The American Society of Breast Cancer and myself as a, uh, an oncologist, you already know what I'm gonna recommend. I'm gonna recommend yearly mammograms until your life expectancy 
is, is less than 10 years. So yearly mammograms until your life expectancy is less than 10 years. There is good news and unfortunately bad news about breast cancer. The good news is absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. Can I get a drum roll from the audience, please? The US death rate from breast cancer has dropped an impressive 43% since 1989. 43% since 1989. And that translates to approximately 450,000 breast cancer lives being saved. 450,000, those are real numbers. And that is from screening and better treatment. Screening and better treatment. Screening and better treatment. Unfortunately, now to the bad news. Breast cancer is the number one cancer killer of African-American women. Breast cancer is the number one cancer killer of African-American women. African-American women have a 40% higher death rate than white women for breast cancer. This difference is multifactorial, complex, and there's actually confusing data around it. But it appears to be biological differences, behavioral differences, cultural differences, and access to care. The main reason that women who are eligible for mammograms don't get screening mammograms is health insurance. 40% of women without health insurance and are eligible for mammograms get yearly mammograms. But for women who have either public or private health insurance, that number jumps up to 70 to 80%. You see the trend, 6%, 60%, now 40% if you're uninsured versus 70 to 80% for breast cancer. Black, white, and Hispanic, and Hispanic women have approximately the same percentage of breast cancer screening rates. Black women, Hispanic women, and white women get their mammograms at, the, at approximately the same rate. Prostate cancer screening. The average risk man should be screened at age 50, at age 45 for African-American men. The greatest benefit in screening has been found between men between ages 55 and 69. Routine screening has been recommended uh, every two years. The American Urological Association does not recommend screening for men uh, over age 70 or men with uh, a life expectancy of less than 10 to 15 years. And, and that's interesting when you talk about as medicine is evolving and people are living longer and longer. I think um, professionally, I think if you have a less than 10% life expectancy, you should you know discontinue screening. But there are a lot of very, very healthy 75-year-old men there are a lot of very, very healthy 75 or 80 year old women. So I think um, an age cut off for screening, um, there are some advantages to that, but there are some also disadvantages as medicine evolves and people are fortunately living longer. A new study from the American Cancer Society suggests that more men are being diagnosed with advanced prostate cancer. More men are being diagnosed, unfortunately, with advanced prostate cancer. And the etiology of that is from the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force recommendation in 2012 that no men, uh, uh, men stop being screened. Now, the American Urologist Association varies that recommendation. So they recommended screening. And then the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force modified that recommendation to begin to recommend screening back in 2018. But unfortunately, some damage was already done. And so, you know, as a mature cancer specialist, I remember treating prostate cancers in the pre-PSA era. There were a lot of men that, that did very poorly with prostate cancer. So I always question 
uh, that recommendation when it came out in 2012. And the data shows that unfortunately in 2017, 26,700 men died of prostate cancer. And in 2022, that's up to 34,500 men. And it appears that the etiology of that was when the no screening uh, recommendation came out in 2012. 75% of eligible men have been screened for prostate cancer with PSA. So we have six, 60, 40 to 70, 80, and 75. And they actually should be in the reverse order. Thank you so much. I love questions. Thank you, Dr. Wills. Um, Dr. Alcindor, I'd like to pass the mic to you, if you will. Yes, uh, my name is Donald Alcindor, as you heard. Uh, I'm a molecular virologist by training, and um, my expertise is in DNA viruses, particularly oncogenic viruses, viruses that induce cancer in people. And so January is Cervical Cancer Awareness Month, and these are some of the stats that are underwhelming. And when we look at this worldwide annually, 528,000 women will be diagnosed with cervical cancer. More than half of them will die. And what that means is that uh, people around the world uh, have a disparity in access and treatment for cancer with over half of them dying. Here in the United States, we have uh, you know, fairly good access to people that want to be screened. And of course, we have good treatment for people as well. Each year, 13,000 women in the U.S. get cervical cancer, and about 4,000 of them will die. And so cervical cancer, almost exclusively, is caused by human papillomavirus. This is a virus that carries a cancer-causing gene, and when it infects epithelial cells of the cervix, these cells can become transformed and develop into cancer cells. This, these cancer cells can spread and develop into metastatic tumors. Any kind of sexual activity can transfer HPVs. 80% of people walking around, men and women, will get an HPV infection in their lifetime. Many of these infections will be asymptomatic and not be a problem. However, over time, if infected with a high-risk HPV, you can develop cancer. And again, these cancers usually develop very slowly and, will, and are amenable to screening and prior treatment before they get out of hand. HPV vaccine is recommended for girls 11 to 12 by the CDC, 11 to 26 overall. All women should be given a cancer screening, that is a cervical cancer screening at age 21. Screening guidelines are, as you see there, starting as early as 21 to 29 with pap testing. The global strategy to eliminate cervical cancer has been proposed. And the idea here is that you have a very good screening tool and you have a vaccine that can prevent infection. That combination gives you the opportunity to eliminate that infection from the public. And this is very important. And so the proposal of eliminating cervical cancer over time in the United States is based on the 90-70-90 uh, proposition. That is, if 90% of girls are fully vaccinated for HPV vaccine at age 15 years old, and if 70% of women are screened with a high performance test by 35 years of age and again by 45, and then 90% of those women are identified with cervical disease and they get treatment, and those that have precancer disease get treatment, and 90% of the women with invasive cancers are managed the possibility of eliminating cervical cancer in the United States is very real. When we look at the HPV vaccines that are out there, they are very important. The opportunity to prevent six different types of cancer with one vaccine. This is amazing when you think about it. And when you think about the incidence of cancer that these vaccines will prevent, cervical cancer, 91% of cervical cancer is caused by HPVs. 91% of anal, uh, anal cancers, 72% of oropharyngeal cancers, 63% of penile cancers, 75% of vaginal cancers. So 
it is very clear that no woman should die of cervical cancer. What we have seen over the years is that with the introduction of the HPV vaccine, we have seen by way of screening and of course by institution of vaccines, we have seen a diminution in cervical cancer deaths in the United States, but there's still work to be done. When we look at cervical cancer screening recommendations by ACOG, the American Society of Colposcopy and Cervical Pathology, as well as the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force, it is very clear that every three years for a woman meeting the age criteria for screening should be screened. PAP tests and co-tests for HPV as well every five years for those 30 to 65 and high-risk HPVs every three years. And again, it changes in terms of ages, but it's very clear that this has to be managed over time. And of course, if you get precancerous lesions, you would get timely treatment preventing you from developing cervical cancer over time. FDA approved vaccines are very clear. To date, we have only one vaccine that is licensed for HPV in the United States, and that is the Gardasil non vaccine. This vaccine will cover an individual for both genital warts that's caused by HPV 6 and 11 and high-risk uh, serotypes of HPV that are responsible for cervical cancer. So nine HPVs in all are covered by the Gardasil non-avalent vaccine. And it is available and it is recommended for both males and females. Despite the proven safety of these vaccines for over 15 years, parents are concerned. Many of these vaccines will be required by children, which uh, requires parental consent. So at 2015, it was 13% decline in HPV vaccines for their child. That has increased to 23% as of 2018. So there's work to be done in counseling, meeting parents where they are, explaining the importance of this vaccine to increase vaccine confidence and uptake. HPV vaccine hesitancy is very real. Again, despite 15 years of consistent evidence that these vaccines are safe and effective, people are still concerned about these vaccines in terms of confidence and uptake. Again, the HP vaccine protects against six different types of cancer. The vaccine is recommended for girls 11 to 12 by the CDC. And again, the Food and Drug Administration. And again, this Gardasil 9 was licensed by the FDA in 2014. Some parents have always cited concerns about safety in declining these vaccines for their children. And, and that's clear. And to this very day, many of them will decline. It seems as though they feel that getting this HB, HPV vaccine as a uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis to HPVs suggests that their kids are sexually active, and it's not so. I want to talk about another very important, and this is one of two of the DNA viruses that are involved in producing cancer, and that is that we have a vaccine to, and this is hepatitis B. Many people are at risk for hepatitis B. We have more than 2.2 million people that are chronically infected with hepatitis B in America. Up to 40% of those chronic infections will lead to liver failure, and of course, could lead to liver cancer. Hepatitis B is 50 times more infectious than HIV in terms of the amount of virus that would be in your bloodstream. Two to three percent, I'm sorry, two to three out of those living with chronic hepatitis B do not know they're infected. So with hepatitis B, this infection can be asymptomatic and you can spread this infection to other people unknowingly. And so many people can get hepatitis B through blood, blood products, through mother to child transmission, tattoos and piercings, barber scarifications, circumcision practices that are done in a unsanitary way, sharing needles by way of IV drug abuse, household contact by basically sharing razors and even earrings where you have blood that can be passed from one person to the next, sharing toothbrushes and so forth, unsterile healthcare practices, and of course, sexual transmission. The symptoms of hepatitis B are very clear. You're going to have a fatigue, 
loss of appetite. You're likely to see dark colored urine, nausea and vomiting, pain in your upper right side of your abdomen, joint pain, hives, headaches, and, and weakness in general. And so with these kind of symptoms, you're likely to go and present clinically. And of course, you need to be tested to be certain that you have hepatitis B. There are a number of vaccines for hepatitis B. The brand a vaccine, Enrix B, is a four-dose vaccine series for both adults and children. Twinrix that will protect you against hepatitis A and hepatitis B is available for adults only. And there's a two-dose vaccine series called Hepsilosav B that is available for adults only. And again, you would have to consult your, with your physician to see what vaccine is most appropriate for you. And again, this is a pre-exposure prophylaxis effort. Again, vaccines are going to work much better prior to exposure to the infectious agent. You will also need venues in order to uh, consult with parents and to try and improve vaccine confidence and uptake. And this will be through interacting with them at venues where parents and children come together. And more so than anything, we have seen through our work with vaccines for COVID that our back to school immunization events is an opportune moment for uh, you to interact with parents and of course vaccinate their children at the same time if they want to. We also know that community vaccinating events are very important and we have been in the business of vaccinating people in community settings, elder care facilities, at churches, and vaccinating people on the job as well. We continue to do this through our uh, solid partnership through the Tennessee SEAL program and other uh, sororities, the medical school, we give health fairs, and we participate with a number of CBOs to drive our message to the public in terms of the importance of cancer preventable vaccines. We also know that pregnant women are not supposed to get the HPV vaccine. However, if you are lactating, you can get the HPV vaccines. We know that we live in a global community and not a United States community. And to not interact with our international partners would be a problem. So we welcome our international partners throughout Tennessee uh, to work with us to make sure that the health and wellness that we bring through vaccinations, get to those communities that are medically underserved. And of course, we work with pregnant moms of young children and their families to make sure that their health and wellness are maintained by uh, giving them timely vaccinations that are free, along with other wraparound services that will support mothers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Alessandra. That's very, very helpful information. I, um, everything you presented was very informative, of course, and I like the graphics at the end because, you know, we have um, a lot of our schools that are on the phone or that will receive this information and perhaps share it. And it um, just gives us reminders of ways to um, maybe um, with health fairs or ways to engage the community um, and share this information. Um, so I appreciate that, especially on the heels of, um, of of Cerebral Cancer Awareness Month. It's very timely information. Um, Carrie, we will now hear from you. I just wanted to um, mention, um, you know, Dr. Alstor talked about um, vaccine hesitancy and certainly um, COVID, this pandemic has, has exacerbated that. And, and, and um, but it's, it's shown us a lot of this racial and health inequalities that are already present. Um, and so, you know, between um, getting people informed and helping to, um, allay some of the concerns about vaccines, hopefully we can see a, a better numbers um, as we come out of the pandemic. Um, but in terms of how um, employers can, can share information with their employees and, and really take help them take charge of their health, I'm thrilled to have you on, Carrie. Jasper Health is a strong partner and, um, and I think is CEO on cancer, CEO Roundtable on Cancer member. Um, a going for gold supporter for sure and a gold standard accredited. So, so triple, triple threat. So thank you for being here. 
Thank you so much. It truly is a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Carrie Hatfield. I'm the Chief Growth Officer at Jasper Health. Um, I actually started as a caregiver 25 years ago when my own mother and, and grandmother were both diagnosed with breast cancer. And they both found um, their cancer through regular self-checks, um, which was later confirmed um, in an annual mammogram. So again, just to stress the importance and of being diligent and um, you know, going to those annual visits, it's, it's so important to catch it early. Um, unfortunately, my family did not, and they, they passed away over 20 years ago. Um, so from a family history perspective, that makes me very high risk. And so I personally do prioritize my annual mammograms. And as Dr. Little mentioned, you know, knowledge is power. And I truly do believe that. Um, as more and more individuals prioritize prevention and early detection, you know, we are finding more and more um, folks are getting diagnosed earlier in their diagnosis, earlier stages. But we're also finding that there's a lot of fear. So when folks go into their screenings, a lot of fear comes with that because the word cancer is really scary. So, you know, Jasper is here to help support those individuals as they wait for their results to come in the mail, as they determine their next steps. So, you know, from a workplace initiative perspective, Jasper Health is available to support your employees, to support caregivers that are supporting, you know, their family members that are affected by cancer. We know it's a difficult time. Um, so many folks are, you know, doing all that they can, right, during this time. And we are trying to lean in to meet them where they are. So we kind of offer three levels of support, if you will. We have digital support where there's resources available from a, a self-service perspective. We have one-on-one -on -one human led coaching support. So if someone needs additional support from a Jasper coach, they act as an extension of the care team. They're available 24 seven to help address gaps in care, um, such as helping with appointments, providing financial guidance, mental health support, nutrition, meal planning, remission, survivorship, and, and much, much more. And then third, we just launched our community group. And this is a, just a really safe space where folks can you know, talk to other folks that are going through the journey that are like them. So they can you know, come together, support each other, um, and cheer each other on as, as they're hitting different milestones. So it's really an uplifting type of atmosphere that, that we have in our community groups. Jasper Health, it's a, it's a hybrid holistic solution, and we have our member at the center of care. So we are a smart planner or a tracking tool and a resource hub all in one. So individuals can track their moods, their medications, their symptoms, their side effects, and we even collect information from wearables like Fitbit and Apple and all of that information is pre-populated in one place. So it's super simple. We try to streamline everything so individuals and caregivers can focus on getting well, focus on showing up for their appointment, um, focus on assigning tasks to their caregivers. They can do that right within our app. So if assistance is needed with picking up a child from school, you know, they can assign that right there within the app to, you know, to their, their relative or, or a, you know, a family friend. So we give that ability um, right within our app. And then as mentioned, we just launched our Jasper community. And this is, you know, one of the, the most top requests from our members to have that safe space to connect with others who are going through a similar journey. They can connect, they can share stories, um, share photos, they can ask questions. It's just a really positive and empowering group of individuals that uplift, support, sympathize with one another. Um, you know, it's it's just a place where there's a, there's a lot of community, and this is available for your employees as well. Um, all of our community groups are moderated by our fantastic coaches, who can lean in and offer support there um, also.
And last but not least, um, we are seeing great results. We're getting really positive feedback from our members. Some have shared that Jasper has helped them, you know, take some of the burden off their care team. We hear that quite a bit. Yeah, they don't want to put burden on their families. And so having a coach or a community to, to lean on is really helpful during this difficult time. Uh, often, you know, folks don't feel so alone on their journey because of Jasper. And we also hear that Jasper gives them hope and, and peace of mind. So, you know, our members no longer have to walk alone. And when we surveyed them, we saw that 68% report having less stress and anxiety, 78 uh, report better medication adherence, and 93% found it easier to remember and track appointments. So again, this is a resource, uh, a community, one-on-one -on -one coaching that is available to your employees um, at a discounted price um, as Joya mentioned, you know, we are proud to be a CEO roundtable on cancer member, a gold standard uh, accredited and going for gold supporter. So if you're interested, you know, please reach out. My email is there. More than happy to talk to you further about some of the services that we offer and how we can support your employees. So thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Carrie. One of the things you you hit on is, is you know, or one of the things that also that the gold standard um, pillar well-being hits on is, um, and I kind of said it, beyond physical health, I think a lot of um, patients when you're diagnosed, you feel like you have, you may have, you should feel like you have from your care team and a path forward for treatment, but it's those those financial concerns, those environmental concerns, the um, the mental, the, you know, um, emotional that is, that is really concerning. I think that's what a lot of survivors or patients mention. So the the peer support, the, the, the resources that you provide are critical for patients and their loved ones um, if they get a diagnosis. So thank you for that. Thank you for sharing that information and thank you for your you. partnership. Um, so we want to make sure that you all have a chance to ask questions. So please put questions in the, in the Q&A box. Of course, you can ask them anonymously if you want to. Um, but I just want to thank our panelists for that information. I think, you know, the tagline for this webinar is empowering people and communities in cancer care. And I guess a, another tagline could be or byline could be um, knowledge is power. So that's what you said, Dr. Littles, and that's that's one of the goals. And so, you know, arming people with information so they can keep seeking information and being able to pose um, questions to their care team, um, to their insurance companies. Um, you know, a lot of, we didn't, I don't know if we talked specifically about social determinants of health, but we all know that, um, you know, so many factors go into um, healthcare and people receiving um, ideal, the best healthcare. So um, as people often say, one of our dear friends, you know, your zip code should not dictate the healthcare you receive, but sometimes it does. So how can we help people to reduce some of the barriers when it comes to healthcare and just take their, be their own best advocate? Um, so I don't know, I can't, I'm having a hard time multitasking, checking Q and A boxes and talking, but, um, one thing I did want to ask Dr. Littles of is if he can please, uh, you mentioned Cologuard and colonoscopy, and I think you were very clear about the gold standard for as far as you're concerned is a colonoscopy, but can you talk a little bit more about the differences in the two and, um, maybe perhaps when someone should, well, let me just ask you to talk a little bit about the differences between the two. Sure, sure. The colonoscopy is 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 a um, in, uh, invasive procedure where a uh, scope uh, you're usually under anesthesia and a scope uh, you you have you know you've been prepped for it. So you take um, medication to to clear the stool uh, out of your bowel. Use it even before. And uh, just so you know, I'm not a hypocrite. I, I've already had two colonoscopies, so. Um, but you use a uh, prep the night before, and um, um, and uh, the uh, physician does is you know puts a scope and goes through your entire colon. Um, and you know the biggest uh, advantage to a colonoscopy is that they it is a very what we call sensitive test, which means it has a what's called a low false negative rate. So if you have a clear colonoscopy, it's less likely 
um, that there's something there that, that needs to be dealt with at that particular time. Um, so they can see polyps, they can, um, and polyps can be precancerous polyps or benign polyps. Um, and the precancerous polyps are the ones that are, are more important, of course, and, but the benign polyps can be removed as well. And then of course, cancers can be uh, biopsied immediately. Um, but the Cologuard is, is a what's called a stool uh, DNA test and it's to be done. The colonoscopy is, is every 10 years the Cologar test is every three years, and it's a, it's a stool test, uh, no anesthesia, no procedure, um, and it detects hidden blood or hidden or caught blood or uh, abnormalities in the DNA, in the, you know, cancers slough off abnormal um, uh, DNA, which is a, is a protein. So when the abnormal DNA is sloughed off the, the um, a Cologar test is considered quote unquote positive. So the 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 um, advantage there is there's no anesthesia. The disadvantage is, is that the false negative rate is higher. So you could certainly have um, pre malignant uh, polyps that at that particular time don't shed DNA and, and at that particular time um, aren't shedding blood. So that's the big disadvantage in, in, in Cologuard, but it's every three years. Uh, the colonoscopy is every 10 years. And the mortality rate reduction on colonoscopy is, the literature says is, is a whopping uh, 50 to 60%. So it's, um, it's certainly, uh, I would consider the gold standard. Thank you for that information, extra information. Sure. Um, Dr. Alcindor, you talked about, again, about vaccine hesitancy. I know that um, our friends at Merck have um, some wonderful information about um, workplace uh, tact strategies that employers can take to help um, their employees um, with, with vaccine uptake. Um, one of the things they say, I like this, I, if I could share the slide and talk at the same time, I would but I will share it post uh, webinar. But one of the things they say about how to take action, get to know the three C's of vaccine hesitancy. It's confidence, complacency, and convenience. So in confidence, it says employees might have a lack of confidence in the safety and effectiveness of vaccines and the system recommending and providing it, which goes to trust. Um, complacency, employees might be complacent in recognizing that vaccine preventable disease can be potentially serious, often not understanding the importance of getting recommended vaccines at the recommended time. And then convenience, employees might perceive that access to vaccines is inconvenient, uncomfortable, and unaffordable. So those three Cs, if you know those, you can try to take action to help or, or have strategies to help um, um, reduce those, those concerns. Um, which is another thing I like about the gold standard application. One of the things it asks is uh, opportunities, for example, for, for employees to, um, maybe pay time off or opportunities for employees to go and get their recommended screenings or vaccines or other strategies that could help um, reduce that burden. So, you know, employers just play such a big role. And um, the more we know as individuals and patients, um, the more em employers know and, and can help really provide um, health and benefits packages to help their employees with their knowledge and, and taking action then um, I think we're all better off. Um, are there any final thoughts or, or, or questions or clarifying opportunities from any of the panels? Yeah, I just wanna say that HPV's infections, uh, the number one sexually transmitted infections in America, we know that there's a very important uh, vaccine. You can be tested for HPV's. And if you have a high risk HPV, you're going to be at higher risk for developing a type of cancer. There are many other HPVs that are not associated with cancer. There's more than 100 different HPVs out there. But what they have done, if they have examined and looked at all of those high risk HPVs that are associated with cancer development, and they have been incorporated into the vaccines. And so what they've done is they, the United States have gotten rid of those vaccines that were bivalent, the early uh, stage vaccines, the Gardasil and the Cerevex, which were bivalent or quadrivalent, and moved up 
to a non-avalent vaccine that captures all of those high-risk HPVs that are associated with cancer. This is a very good vaccine that has been tested on 15,000 people in many different trials. This is a vaccine that is continually going through pharmacovigilance, meaning that they're following efficacy and safety of this vaccine until this day and on. This vaccine, in terms of its ability to be to have antibodies that are a high level to protect people has gone out to 12 years in the people that have received the vaccine and have shown that antibody levels are high and are protective. And so when you think about all of the things that you could take a vaccine for, to be able to take a vaccine to prevent you from getting cancer, that's a very powerful vaccine. There's only two of them out there, but I know with the new technologies that have been introduced by the COVID vaccine uh, productions, I think that you will see more vaccines that prevent more cancers in the future. And so I've, I'm excited about what will come in the future when it comes to cancer preventable vaccines. Thank you, likewise, very powerful. So knowledge is power is the, is the hashtag, is the, is the theme of the day and, and henceforth. Um, there are opportunities aplenty, that this is ongoing opportunities to share this information with your employees, with your friends and family. You never know the impact you'll have on someone saving a life or prolonging lifespan if you share this information. But keeping people um, informed is what we can do and um, helping them be their own best advocates in their care. So I really want to thank our panelists. I appreciate it. Thank you for our attendees. And um, we have recorded this and we'll share it so that you can share it with others.